Hello, and welcome to State of the Revolution. The, revolu the political revolution gathering across the country today is led from the grassroots up, powered by people from across the political spectrum, organized by our common values, goals, and circumstances. The revolution is a movement beholden to no political party, organizing to find, understand, and use the tools available to change the world, modifying or building new tools as necessary. Our election system is a tool designed by wealthy white men who owned land, kept slaves, and feared democracy, designed to ensure perpetual rule by the tiny minority of people just like them. For centuries, our forebears have fought, bled, and died to expand the vote to black, female, and poor people. They left us a tool better than the one they found. It's our turn now. On November 6th, across the state of Michigan, we'll be going to the polls to vote on, three propo on two proposals that are directly uh, related to voting rights, Proposal 2 and Proposal 3. Today on State of the Revolution, I have with me Fred Fry, a Lansing attorney and voting rights activist, a volunteer with Promote the Vote, uh, the organization behind Proposal 3. And also Kelly Collison, uh, chairwoman of the Michigan Democratic Party Progressive Caucus, to discuss Proposal 3, its implications for voting rights, and what the next steps are after that. So first I'd like to turn it over to Fred and uh, ask you to tell us about Proposal 3, how it affects voting rights, and uh, uh, why you support it. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned values, Leonie, because that's really what we start with in terms of fairness to people, all of whom should be able to vote that are fully registered and uh, qualified. but. There have been roadblocks placed in the way in a number of states, including now a little bit in Michigan, but many other states have adopted a, an approach to saying, well, we want our people to vote, but not the, those people, the, uh, the others. Uh, so Proposal 3 is originally started out with the name Promote the Vote. Mm. And so that entails the, the making sure that people have the actual right in practice to vote mm -hmm. and that their votes will be counted fairly. Mm -hmm. It's uh, supported and uh, was originated by uh, three main groups, which are the ACLU of Michigan, the NAACP, and mm -hmm. the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. And it consists of eight m separate parts which mm -hmm. would um, amend the Michigan Constitution mm -hmm. to make sure that the people that have a vested interest in maybe having some groups not vote mm -hmm. to make sure that those people can vote in a fair election. Mm -hmm. So fair and honest voting <coughs> is really the linchpin. We also talk, our Constitution talks in terms of due process. Mm -hmm. And what, what I've been taught uh, right along in political science in the law school mm -hmm. is that due process is fair process is mm -hmm. fair play. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic impetus for Promote the Vote. Mm -hmm. Those eight changes would, would include protecting the right to vote by secret ballot. We mm -hmm. do have a secret ballot now, but only, only because of statute. Now, mm -hmm. It's not in the, our Michigan Constitution. Mm -hmm. Make sure that military people have the right to have their votes counted so that they get their ballots 45 days before the election. Mm -hmm. In fact, our uh, one of the Secretary of State's candidates, whose spouse was in uh, overseas mm -hmm. fighting, uh, their vote, wa their ballot was returned to them mm -hmm. uh, before that person had their had the op opportunity to vote. So, mm -hmm. making sure our military people sure. get the right to vote, uh, registering citizens with the Secretary of State when they are. Uh, when they are registering for their driver's license, mm -hmm. almost automatically, unless mm -hmm. they decline. They don't have, nobody has sure. to vote. But to make it as easy as possible to register to vote. Mm -hmm. To allow citizens to vote for, uh, to register by mail with up until two weeks before the election, and on the same day if they show up uh, with um, proof of residency and up to any, any time before the uh, election is over and to provide all registered voters with access to absentee. Mm -hmm. Right now, I can vote absentee because of my age, mm -hmm. but, in, but other people, people may, that may have two jobs or mm -hmm. may be expecting a child, sure. make it, it makes it very difficult for uh, those people to, read, to vote absentee without mm -hmm. having the right to do so, so automatically. So mm -hmm. that would be guaranteed under this proposal. Mm -hmm. 
allowing voters to vote with a straight ticket voting, mm -hmm. which speeds up the process of voting. If people are know that are, they're going to vote for one party, whether it's mm -hmm. Republican or Democrat, sure. if they know they're going to vote for all one person, uh, for 127 years, they've had the right to vote straight ticket in Michigan. Mm -hmm. That is not the case now, and that's ac actually il illustrative of why this proposal is necessary, to put it in part of the Constitution. But we can get more into that. You mean to put it in the Constitution rather than leave it under the hands of the legislature, who have repeatedly demonstrated, for example, in the way they just gerrymandered uh, in 2010. And again, not uh, it's just just Republicans who happen to do that in Michigan, but uh, as the, uh, you know, best uh, one of the best other examples is Maryland, where the Democrats do it. Um, so we're not, it's not a partisan thing at all. It's, we need to take, uh, we need to take access to the ballot and, 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 and the power to put blocks in front of that away from people who have a vested interest uh, in maintaining their own position in the government. Precisely, and actually the Michigan legislature just before the 2016 election mm -hmm. took that straight ticket voting away, mm -hmm. which was ruled unconstitutional by the federal district court, mm -hmm. but that was recently overturned by the U.S. Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. And so right now, and you and everyone should know that they don't have the right to vote straight ticket in the 2018 mm -hmm. election in Michigan, mm -hmm. unlike the 100 previous 127 years, mm -hmm. which right. uh, this would restore that right. right. And then to ensure the accuracy of the and security of elections to call for an audit mm -hmm. that's triggered and that some of those some of the details of these principles mm -hmm. would actually be delegated to the legislature mm -hmm. and to the rulemaking process to make sure that the, they're implemented. But right. the basic eight provisions are mm -hmm. the ones that I just outlined. Sure. Um, so uh, th th that's great. That's a good, uh, good explanation of, of the laws, uh, uh, of the proposal as I understood it as well. Um, and uh, I just want to point out, I, I, I'm not promoting these in particular, but actually Ballot Balladopedia has a nice chart. If you go there, they have a nice chart that lays out where the law is now, what the changes would be, and what the consequence of that would be. So that'd be a good place they to They do, and another way to access that information is uh, in an explanation and, and uh, thorough is uh, promotethevotemi.com. Promotethevotemi.com. Yes. Okay, great. And that's got some more rationale about the reasons for this online too so if you want to sure if, if people want to um, get more information about it promote sure. the vote mi.com right so i've got some other questions but i want to go over to kelly and uh, because i know that uh, you had some problems originally with the uh, with the straight ticket voting uh, part of this uh, maybe with other parts as well Can you tell tell us a little bit about um, you know where you where you were at and what what changed your mind yeah, actually, for the last couple of years, I've heard a lot of people, especially a lot of Democrats, say, we need straight ticket voting. Straight ticket voting is so important. And, you know, the main reason that was always said was because of lines at the polls. And I thought, well, we should just have more polling places then. And then... We should do that, too, obviously. Yeah, we should. We should definitely still do that. Uh, but then I voted absentee this year because I'm going to be out of town um, on Election Day trying to get more people out to vote. Um, and it took 15 minutes just to fill out my ballot, about 20 minutes total to go through the whole process of getting the ballot and filling it out and everything. And that just is unacceptable. There's absolutely no reason that we should be spending 20 minutes at the polls filling out our ballots. And that's going to create longer li wait lines. It's going to make it harder for people to vote. It's going to um, decrease the accessibility for voting. And um, yeah, I definitely changed my mind pretty much two minutes after voting <laughs> because okay. that was absolutely obnoxious that I could have just pressed, you know, Democrat. I was voting for all the Democrats on the mm -hmm. ballot anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because I didn't look up the candidates or right. that I wasn't educated on the candidates. I right. was. I was fully educated on the candidates. It's just that the Democrats were the ones that I was choosing that I felt aligned sure. m like best with my values. So instead of just checking one box at the top and then being able to spend five minutes filling out the rest of the ballot, I had to go through and bubble every single person, sure. which just seemed way too excessive. Right, so, th so a couple of things about that. So first of all, um, you mentioned about, you know, that you researched all the candidates and all that, and I think it's, I think it's, I, 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 we, did, we, we did try to, by the way, get somebody who was in opposition, and, and just to tell you, uh, 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 they ended up not being in opposition after we had a short discussion about it. So uh, that's why we don't have somebody in opposition here, is that, that, that that's, uh, 
that's what happened, then they didn't want to come on. Um, but uh, one of the objections that I hear from people is that, uh, is that, well, you know, it encourages people to not do that kind of research. And I, uh, uh, you, what, what, what do you think about that? Is that, is that, a, is that, a, is that a viable uh, uh, objection that, well, if we, if we have this option, then some people won't do the research? One of the things I like to do is try to figure out the motivation of the people that say, you know, in high-minded mm -hmm. principles, what, what is their real motivation? Mm -hmm. And so uh, in terms of does it encourage people not to do some research, yes, there are, there's probably some, some uh, grain of truth in that, mm -hmm. that philosophy. Sure. However, as Kelly just mentioned, if, if you align philosophically with mm -hmm. the one party or another, mm -hmm. it could be the two major parties or it could be a mm -hmm. minor party, if you align philosophically mm -hmm. with a party, Mm -hmm. and you don't know all the people that are running perhaps for Michigan Court of Appeals mm -hmm. or in other elections, the State Board of Education, mm -hmm. um, then you have at least a little bit more to go on when mm -hmm. you have a party affiliation mm -hmm. because that gives you some information, mm -hmm. maybe not as much as preferable. Sure. But uh, there are some people that I <coughs> remember from political science classes that, that take an extreme view, and mm -hmm. that is that uh, it's good that um, people that don't have full information don't vote. Mm -hmm. And because that only the people that are the elites that have all kinds of information should be the ones to vote. And then at one time back in our history, there, there was a literacy test before mm -hmm. people could vote. So I take the opposite view that everyone has an inherent right as and value as a citizen. And that b because of that, everyone has an equal right to vote, whether mm -hmm. you're extremely wealthy or mm -hmm. extremely well-educated mm -hmm. or not. And uh, the education process can, can be ongoing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, in terms of this particular ballot proposal, it's very important to remember that it's not a requirement that you vote state straight ticket. Mm -hmm. You definitely can sw uh, vote for both parties. It's just an option. And another one of those, the reasons why that's an important option is because historically in the United States, and mm -hmm. maybe less so in Michigan, but not entirely, uh, historically in urban areas, there's been, there have been longer lines simply because there haven't been enough polling stations. And whether that's be by design or by accident, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Sure. Uh, people have an, an intrinsic, inherent right and duty to vote. Mm -hmm. And to take that away from them, if they have to wait for two hours in line, for example, in mm -hmm. certain areas of the state, mm -hmm. simply because the ballots are too long, mm -hmm. that's not fair to the mm -hmm. people that have to wait mm -hmm. and probably have to leave before the two hours is up, if that er ever is the case. And we could eliminate some of those problems by actually having, you know, having a week to vote, for example, yeah. or having a holiday, uh, you know, like a two or three day holiday, I would argue, uh, 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 for our voting. Uh, but there's also another objection that I want to make, a principled objection to uh, this idea that, that straight ticket voting uh, encourages people to not, you know, to, to not do as much research and so on. And that principled objection is, is that we shouldn't be telling people what their criteria for voting ought to be. You know, we shouldn't. Uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't be telling people how they ought to prepare to vote. That's up to them. Right. Now, uh, uh, now, if we're concerned about their education in terms of the the the, uh, 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 the people running or the issues or any of that, then you know what we would do? We would fund education and we would say that literacy is a human right, and we wouldn't have courts, as recently was done, saying that th that that Michigan that that the state doesn't have an obligation to uh, provide good enough education that people can read, which is literally what the uh, current uh, uh, Michigan uh, uh, administration, uh, you know, has, has, uh, has pushed through the courts and the courts have, have agreed that, that Michigan doesn't have the obligation to provide that kind of education. So I think when you see conservatives who support the current legislature, the current governor, Bill Schuette, who was uh, involved in that lawsuit, and they say that, well, we want people to be educated, sure, put your money where your mouth is. Otherwise, I don't believe that that's why you're doing it. I think you're doing it because you are trying to suppress people who don't agree with you uh, and prevent them from voting. And uh, I think you should be ashamed of that. Um, Agreed. And one thing that's 
significant to me historically, even when the Republicans had control of the Secretary of State's office, mm -hmm. uh, most of the Secretaries of State have been sympathetic to the idea that more people should vote. More, it, the process should be fair and accessible to mm -hmm. everyone. But now um, you can look around the country and see in states like Georgia, mm -hmm. Kansas, where we have two secretaries of state that are also running for governor at the mm -hmm. same time. Right, in Georgia and Kansas. <coughs> yep. Georgia and Kansas. Mm -hmm. And they have a, those candidates have a vested interest in, in making sure they pick mm -hmm. their voters. Right. Similar to Proposal 2, what, what, they did, what they're trying to do. Uh, they're trying to well, restrict similar, similar to gerrymandering, exactly. which is what Proposal 2 is against. <coughs> proposal 2 is trying to end gen gerrymandering, right. and, and uh, that's a good thing, too. Sure. The pe same people that support Proposal 3, mm -hmm. and I personally support Proposal 2 very strongly, sure. because it takes away that right of, of the elected officials to mm -hmm. pick their voters right. instead of the other way around. Right. So um, when, when there's voter suppression efforts, Mm -hmm. um, whether it's in other states right now, but in Michigan mm -hmm. eventually, mm -hmm. that's just wrong to mm -hmm. try to suppress mm -hmm. uh, votes. If you look at Florida, there's a ballot issue in Florida right now that uh, would reverse. Um, they're one of four states now, I believe, that's that have uh, prohibited people that have served time for a crime, minor mm -hmm. or major, uh, so that 1.5 million people in Florida cannot vote simply because of past mm -hmm. past incidents that occurred in their life, mm -hmm. and that even if they're if they've uh, done Served their time, their time and paid their debt to society, exactly. as people like to say, yeah, paid their debt to society. Those people currently in Florida cannot vote. Mm -hmm. That's an extreme uh, situation where a state is purposely trying to restrict voting rights. Right. And that's on the ballot now. Right. Hopefully uh, the citizens of Florida will change that mm -hmm. and allow people that have served their time, paid their mm -hmm. debt to society, to allow them to vote. I, I, by the way, I actually think that that's not far enough because um, I, I, think it's I think it's important to point out some of the hypocrisy at, at, at the core of our founding. So for example, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, in, in, in his justification for rebelling against the, the English crown, he wrote that uh, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now there isn't anybody more governed than somebody in prison. Okay. Now of course that sentiment, consent of the governed, did not make it into the Constitution. Uh, in the consti and, and not only did it not make it into the federal constitution, it didn't make it into any of the state constitutions of that generation or later generations. It didn't make it into the Michigan constitution when it was re rewritten in 1963. Um, uh, and as a result, the founding generation in their constitutions, multiple of them, federal and state, uh, it uh, uh, set up standards that in order to vote you had to be white, male, wealthy, and own land. Um, uh, it wasn't the, the our country was not designed was not intended to be a democracy or a republic it was intended to be an oligarchy of white wealthy white uh, landowners male la wealthy white male landowners and the fact of the matter is that to a great extent that system has created rule by uh, uh, by wealthy white men if you look at if you look at the statistics on it um, uh, since we've had 50 states, every two, it, well, sin since the founding, every two years we elected new legislatures, state and federal. If we just look at the last 60 years, so that we don't, people don't say, well, that was a long time ago, let's just look at the last 60 years. The last 60 years, there's been, uh, there's been, uh, uh, we're just coming up on, an, on another one, but there, up until now there's been 29 different election cycles where we've seated 51 different legislatures, state and federal. 29 times 51 is 1,479 different legislatures that have been seated where the not just the majority but the supermajority was wealthy white men okay. exactly the group that the founders wanted to maintain control over the country indefinitely um, and uh, when we're talking about uh, voter suppression when we're talking about the structure of how the power of the vote gets translated through the machinery of government into policy uh, uh, we've never been anything other than an oligarchy of wealthy white men 
Uh, and right now, what we're trying to do, in the footsteps of our of of our uh, of our forebears, as I mentioned in the uh, in the introduction, is break that system and make it in and 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 and, and uh, reformulate our government so that we actually have a democracy uh, and a republic uh, and not an oligarchy. Um, and that's why I think that this, this proposal and many of the other voting rights proposals, including especially Proposal 2, uh, anti-gerrymandering, is really important. We have to be aware of the history that we're coming from and what we're trying to do is to make a real democracy out of this myth that we're supposed to have it. So, so one anyway. of the other things that Sorry, I wanted yeah. to bring up on the straight ticket mm -hmm. side of things is um, I'm good friends with uh, people that are very involved with Represent Us. Mm -hmm. um, and ranked choice voting is a huge issue for us. Um, how will straight ticket being pushed into our constitution, how will that affect ranked choice voting in the future if we tried to implement ranked choice voting at the local, state, or federal level? You might level? want to explain ranked choice voting a little bit because um, it's, it's a newer concept, but... Yeah, yeah. So with ranked choice voting, um, instead of just voting for one person, say you're voting for your city clerk, for example, and they're, well, city clerk's probably not a good example in Lansing, but say there's multiple parties for city that are running for city clerk. Mm -hmm. You can, instead of just choosing, um, you're, you want to vote for the Democrat, you want to vote for the Republican or a third party, you can say, hi, I kind of like the Green Party candidate better than everybody else, so I'm going to put a one next to that person mm -hmm. because that's my top choice. Mm -hmm. I want to rank um, the Democrat as my second choice, yeah. the Republican as my third, the Libertarian as my fourth, and an Independent as my fifth. And then um, the system actually figures out who... It's very difficult for me mm -hmm. to explain. Do you understand and that? California yeah. actually has adopted that, I believe. Yeah, so. for local, yeah. local and elections. State. Yeah. And yeah. in some cases, you have a uh, Democrat running against another Democrat because mm -hmm. those are the two top vote getters. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of uh, allowing um, straight ticket voting, it, it could create some issues that need to be ironed out. The legislature can do that under this proposal because there are constitutional provisions and then implementation by, by statute. Mm -hmm. But the statute can't override the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So to allow for newer concepts like this to, to be effective, then, mm -hmm. then it needs to be adjusted. So that's one of the things too in both proposal two and proposal three that I've heard as far as some of the opposition mm -hmm. to it is why why is it so detailed and especially particularly with proposal two mm -hmm. well one of the things you've got to remember though is that um, these both of these proposals two and three mm -hmm. are designed to take some power not very you know in one particular area which is voting mm -hmm. away from the legislature uh, legislators that have a vested interest in their own self-preservation mm -hmm. and so in order to do that and accomplish that it, it has to be fairly specific in many respects mm -hmm. but not in every respect and in, in, in terms of the um, straight ticket voting provision there is room to flesh out the details in statute mm -hmm. okay so then that actually because it seems like if we have straight ticket voting and it's in our constitution mm -hmm. that ranked yeah. choice voting wouldn't be able to work very well with that because if it's constitutionally protected that straight ticket voting has to be a thing, how can we straight ticket vote with ranked choice voting? Well, actually there's there's a couple of ways that you can do it. One of the, one of the things is is that as it is right now, um, uh, if you were to, if we had straight, straight ticket voting like we used to have, uh, uh, up until the Re Republican legislature uh, eliminated it, um, you could choose a particular party, mm -hmm. okay, but then you could also split your ticket by, you know, choosing, choosing, you know, I want to choose everybody in this party, but where I go down and select somebody else, I'm splitting my ticket right. that way. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do any, you can, you can still mark the one up here, 
uh, and then uh, and then mark you know however many others and other on, on, on in, in other parts of, in other uh, columns because it's a col as a candidate uh, party columns right. Right, you know is the way that, okay so uh, you cho choose the one that you want to devote most of your stuff in like say you know say there's maybe 30 different positions that are partisan you choose that and then maybe there are four or five of them or ten of them that you want to actually move over to different different party so you choose the party that you want your most in and then you choose the individuals that you want other places and that's just it's just an it's just an efficient way to fill out the ballot is all that straight ticket voting is now when you have when you have um, uh, ranked choice voting one of the things that you, the way that you would do it is you would is is uh, you could check this the 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 party uh, uh, the party uh, uh, bubble at the top so that'd be the straight ticket for that party uh, and then you could go down to an, to any of those places where there was uh, you know you know uh, where there was a, a ranked choice option and um, uh, and go over to the next party, you know, that somebody else that you wanted uh, uh, for that, you know, the, n the next person. So either you're, uh, say, for example, for you, the Democrats might be your first choice, and then maybe the Greens would be your second choice. So you just go down to that row, go over to the green column, and write a number two. And right. your, your, your ranked choice at the, you know, from the first would just be for the Democratic column. So that you could you could do it that way. It's not it's not that difficult. You just have you just have to say okay if I'm voting that way then um, my first choice is in the Democratic column and then I fill in my other choices. And if my first choice isn't in the Democratic column, just like regular uh, straight ticket voting that we had, as you said, was it 127 years? You said. Yep. Um, you go over to you go over and mark a one in you know maybe in the Republican column if you like that person better for you know that particular office. Um, and then that that changes that to uh, to that being the, the rank choice the, the first rank in the choices. So that's I mean I, I don't think that's a big deal. It's a uh, it, 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 it it takes an extra sentence to explain basically. Yeah, there's does a, that make there's sense? A, it does, and yeah. I'd like to move on to a little bit slightly sure. different um, issue in sure. this in this whole area, mm -hmm. and that is um, what I've heard as some criticism of these proposals to expand voting rights, mm -hmm. and and being that. Um, well, if you do that, then there's all kinds of fraud that's going to result. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a study uh, bun done by a um, Loyola Law School professor, mm -hmm. Justin Levitt, who looked at all the elections, um, state, national, and local, between the year 2000 and Year, the year 2014. So you've got like a billion votes. I think this one absolutely has. Yes. a billion votes altogether were cast in right. this time period uh, that uh, this study was undertaken. Mm -hmm. And f as far as cr credible evidence of actual voter fraud mm -hmm. impersonating somebody else right. and then voting twice, right. there were only 31 instances of mm -hmm. that documented. Oh, wow. Right. Um, oh, and what was that? 14 years or 13 years? 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so in those elections, only 31 credible instances of right. actual impersonation of right. somebody else, mm -hmm. which is billion. all the fear, you know, that's the, mm -hmm. the, the, the statement that, you know, this is going to be terrible because you're never right. going to figure out who is who. Well, truly, it's extremely difficult to impersonate somebody without getting caught. Um, in contrast, mm -hmm. the number of people that were actually denied the right to vote mm -hmm. over over the years, mm -hmm. uh, this just pales in comparison and as a problem to that in terms of voter suppression mm -hmm. and the e effectiveness of it. Mm -hmm. Because you can say that you're trying to protect accuracy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what you're really doing is restricting the rights of voters to actually vote in, in practice. Right. No, a absolutely. And the other thing is that you have, you know, vast numbers of people that uh, that are denied the right to vote in through through a number of different means and even further, even people who get the right to vote don't actually get any significant rep representation uh, for a lot of the structural reasons, uh, you know, that we talked about in, in the Prop 2 uh, uh, podcast last week, but um, we'll probably get to some of those uh, here uh, here as well. So I know I absolutely agree. The, the voter fraud objection is patently absurd. 
Uh, it's just the data does not support it. It's purely magical thinking okay. in, 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 uh, on the part of people who want to use this as a fear tactic to prevent people that will not vote for them, most likely, from voting. Mm -hmm. These people don't believe in democracy. They don't want there to be a democracy. They're constitutional originalists. And under the original constitution, we have a plutocratic oligarchy that's ruled by the wealthy. Um, so we need to be careful about these people making these claims and call them out on it whenever possible. Yes, and to be fair, you know, the Democrats, when they had control of the legislature, they, they would gerrymander too. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know of any attempts to suppress voting mm -hmm. at all, uh, which is a kind of a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. newer phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, nationally. Mm -hmm. Now, the Voting Rights Act took care for a while of a number of attempts to suppress the vote. Yeah. But in a 19, or excuse me, in a 2013 case, Shelby County uh, versus Holder, Mm -hmm. The U.S. Supreme Court restricted the impact yep. of the Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. to say that um, the, the pre-approval process, which for states that historically had yep. the had taken away the, yep. the right to vote for people, that that has, was right. no longer in effect. Right. So since 2013, it's mm -hmm. opened up the door to some states, yep. and Michigan should not be one of those states, opened up the door to... Uh, round two of voter suppression. Round two of Jim Crow. Let's yes, let's be let's exactly. be accurate. This, this is what we're talking about: is Jim Crow, and it's not just Jim Crow. Uh, it, it's Jim it's, it's 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 Jim Crow kinds of laws against the poor, uh, and uh, and doubly against uh, minorities who are more likely to be poor. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, I mean, it's just uh, the. Uh, and it is. And let me just say, it is both parties. I mean, I, w I was, I was, I, I, I've, I've, I joined the Democratic Party just in 2016, um, after the uh, af after the election, um, and uh, I'm, I was, I, I was astounded that there's that there are lawyers in the Democratic Party that hold su hold positions, for example, parliamentarian, um, who don't understand, for example. Um, uh, cumulative voting, mm -hmm. which is a voting system that is explicitly one of the key voting systems that the federal courts use to enforce the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Right. Um, and in, uh, I, I was participating in a Democratic Party election where they said they were going to use cumulative voting and then used plurality winner first past the post voting and claimed that that was the same thing, which is exactly what cumulative voting is designed to, uh, to, to, to alleviate the problems of. Right. You know, and, and these are people that are, you know, leaders in the Democratic Party that don't understand not only their own bylaws, but the actual, you know, cumulative voting used by the used to enforce the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I'm sorry, that just still blows my mind <laughs> to this day. Just a little bit better still. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not bitter about it. It's, it. it's really there's a lot of people that would that would say that to me, but it's not about being bitter. It's about being surprised that. You know, people aren't paying that uh, aren't paying at least that much attention, especially people that are, uh, you know, in position uh, in positions of authority within the party that are supposed to know better. So these these restrictions on the process to make mm -hmm. sure they're fair right. <coughs> would apply to both parties. Yeah, and absolutely. The last uh, one that I mentioned uh, calls for an audit of the elections uh, in case of uh, any kind of alleged faulty wrong. Right. And so th there is built into promote, promote the vote proposal three, mm -hmm. the provision for accuracy mm -hmm. and f and fairness and mm -hmm. making sure that the elections are conducted right. properly. Right. Let me, let me just ask about that because there's a big problem. One of the there's a and I'm I'm trying to remember the exact wording. I should have made a note of it. But there's a there's a provision currently in Michigan law that actually actually ends up preventing recounts. Um, not because of uh, the inability to recount, but because of some technicalities about how th certain things are handled. Um, do, do, you do you know what yes, I'm talking I about? Yes, I do, because I've been involved in recounts before, sure. and uh, to me that makes absolutely zero sense. Right. And so that should be addressed by the courts, and hopefully uh, the Proposal 3 will, will give the, enough uh, ammunition to make sure that that is ruled unconstitutional as well. Right, okay, so basically the way that Prop 3 would solve that, if I've understood what you're saying correctly, is by creating a standard that says you have to have this kind of a, an ability to recount, mm -hmm. and if you have a statute, which is what we're... The, to would, audit, which is not actually defined in the Constitution, again, right. you have to leave some things back uh, to be implemented right. by statute. So uh, as part of that definition standard, there needs to be a change in the, in the law that 
right. that uh, really makes it impossible to have an effective recount under current law. Right, right, right. One of the things that I was wondering about is so it takes a lot of effort to do a, ballot, a statewide ballot initiative. Uh, can you give some rundown so everyone knows? how much effort it took, how many volunteers you might yeah. have had, um, and how long you had to, like the time frame you had to do that, what kind of effort that took, and if you're going to use that momentum to go for another round of a ballot initiative and what's that gonna look like in the future? Well, it's hard to predict what's gonna happen in terms of other ballot uh, initiatives because we don't know exactly what the, <laughs> what the people that wanna suppress the votes are gonna try to do. Uh, there may well be a time when another val ballot initiative is necessary. But we started in early April on uh, Promote the Vote and uh, turned in the signatures in August, I believe it was. Needed 400,000, 415,000 valid signatures. We uh, collected more than that, but uh, the process itself was very time consuming. And in this case, we had all kinds of volunteers, and I was one of those. We also had some paid circulators that helped uh, to get the uh, issue on the ballot. Um, so uh, in terms of the proposal too, it was almost all volunteers. Yeah. And that's an extremely impressive um, effort on the part of many, many people. Mm -hmm. uh, some okay. of the same volunteers that were utilized in proposal two are, <laughs> are helping in proposal three and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're, you know, because they're basically both trying to increase the fairness mm -hmm. in the electoral system. Right. right. That's awesome, awesome, yeah. really cool. I'm hoping that um, after all of this that uh, a lot of those volunteers from Prop 2 and 3 are going to get involved with um, the ranked choice voting effort. I think that that is going to be a huge thing um, that will benefit our democracy because I think right now with the comfortability of our two-party system that we need to shake things up a little bit and make sure that our representatives actually realize that they have to represent us. and that it doesn't matter what their donors look like. If we can rank our votes and don't feel like we're going to be throwing them away, mm -hmm. that they could actually lose their position of power to someone that will represent us. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I served on the legislative staff, uh, you, it was almost all male. There were a few, mm -hmm. uh, few women. Uh, but, you know, when you think about it, it's only been a little over 100 years that women have had the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And it's been... Um, only a little over 100 years since we've had the right to directly elect senators, too. Yeah. So, you know, it's step by step. You know, I, there's an old maxim that say you start where the client is. You mm -hmm. start where the system is. Mm -hmm. right. And you're right, there are a lot of things that need to be changed in our system. But these are real positive changes that are going to increase the fairness, mm -hmm. the fundamental fairness, regardless mm -hmm. of which party Absolutely. is affected mm -hmm. by the people that would want to restrict the vote to just some elites. Right. Yeah. Um, this would make it very difficult to do that in Michigan. <clears throat> They're probably going to need going to be repeated uh, steps that will be taken in Michigan, but this, this will put Michigan in the forefront. <clears throat> Many years ago, 50 years ago or so, Michigan was in the forefront of mm -hmm. uh, voter rights, and we had the voter motor voter uh, mm -hmm. statute, which became federal law. Mm -hmm. And Michigan was one of the was the first state to adopt that. But we have leg behind other states, and there are a number of provi uh, provisions in this promote the vote mm -hmm. uh, initiative that other states have already adopted. Mm -hmm. Michigan has not. So we're right. getting back up to speed mm -hmm. just up to where other states are right now. Sure. But uh, this will be very significant proposal right. two and proposal three. Right. Now the chances of passage, some people have been asking about that and there have been some recent polling data on that uh, mm -hmm. that you're probably familiar with even just today that was announced. Yeah, so uh, the polling that just came out, actually there's an article in the Free Press I think uh, you might be referring to, uh, it shows Prop 3 uh, is the least controversial of all the uh, of, of the three proposals with something like 69 percent. I'm looking at it right here. The chart looks like it's 69 percent in favor and about 25, maybe 26 percent against, according to this chart here. Um, whereas uh, you know the others are you know at uh, 59 or right around right around 60 percent. So it's about 10 points more popular uh, uh, and has much less opposition uh, even uh, 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 than than either of the other two proposals. So I mean I think it's I think it's pretty clear to most people that this is all about 
uh, improving uh, improving access to the ballot in a fair way and taking uh, power away from those people who might try to prevent that. So agreed. <clears throat> and in terms of fairness, it's true that a lot of these pr points in this proposal are current law. Right. But that doesn't mean they'll stay current law because it, uh, this what this does is again it basically puts it in the Constitution mm -hmm. that these rights cannot be taken away. But because of that too, because they're not radical, mm -hmm. uh, they're they're really apple pie things that everyone can get behind. Right. As far as I know, there's not organized opposition, or at least a lot of not, no mm -hmm. no uh, organized group has come out against mm -hmm. it because right. uh, this is something that's needed to make sure mm -hmm. that we have fair, free elections and that uh, there's accountability within sure. the system. Right, and and by the way, um, I would still love talking to anybody out there who's actually uh, has a significant opposition to this. I would more than be more than happy to have you on, uh, on our next show uh, and uh, see what you have to say about it. But uh, I don't really think, I, I, have, I have yet to find an, uh, 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 an idea in opposition to this that, that makes the least bit of sense. Agreed. Yeah. So, um, what, so, so for me, part of the next question is, you know, as I as as we've mentioned in various different forms, this is one one step in a much longer process that predates us. Uh, you know that our forefathers has, have have uh, our, our forebears uh, uh, have fought to uh, uh, to make our system more democratic and uh, more representative of the people. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a step further in that direction. But it's still just one step. There are lots of other steps we could take. What do you think are some of the next steps? that we need to be looking at uh, to improve, uh, to, to actually to, to transform what was designed as a plutocratic oligarchy into a democracy or a democ democratic republic. Uh, what do you think some of, the, some of the next things related to voting, in, in this case, since we're talking about Prop 3 and some of the other voting changes? One of the things we need to do is watch what happens nationally on some of these proposals to restrict voting mm -hmm. because if some of those do get enacted mm -hmm. uh, or or held constitutional then Michigan is going to be at risk mm -hmm. depending on the makeup of the legislature sure. uh, and uh, so we need to be vigilant another thing just going back one step too sure. even though the polling data looks good mm -hmm. it's no reason there is absolutely no reason to uh, give up the the intense effort to get sure. this approved because people do need to know that it, it is important to make sure mm -hmm. that our rights are preserved. Right. And uh, same thing with, uh, with the, the rest of the things on the ballot. We have um, candidates uh, that uh, could go one way or the other. Sure. Uh, we have Supreme Court candidates. Right. Uh, and to have those people fairly looking at constitutional right. provisions is extremely important as well. Right, especially since, uh, you know, like you said, necessarily when you write a constitutional amendment, you have to leave uh, some room for implementation right. because the implementation gets into details that require that that requires a a, a more hands-on approach to making sure that uh, that we work out any of the any of the issues. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, and, th and, and then as a result, there's going to be challenges in front of the Michigan Supreme Court because this is a change to the Michigan Constitution. Uh, so I've, I've, shout I've made a shout out on this show before. I'll do it again for Sam Bagenstos and, and Megan Kavanaugh, who are running for the Michigan Supreme Court right now. It's an opportunity to flip the court from 5-2 in favor of some very, very conservative uh, uh, people on the court to 4-3 in favor of uh, a more uh, liberal progressive court that will look at voting rights not as a constitutional originalist, where if you're a constitutional originalist, you, you, know, you have all of these restrictions to voting. Right now in the U.S. Constitution, there isn't an outright uh, right to vote. There's a, there's there's a prohibition on on what you can and can't use to prevent people from voting, mm -hmm. but that leaves open a whole wide range of stuff, which is one of the things that Prop Three is here to address. So yeah, some of the stuff that we were talking about off screen was um, the natives and was it North Dakota? Native Americans, Native North, Dakota, right. North Dakota. Yeah, D disenfranchised by the Supreme Court just recently, right? Mm -hmm. For not having the right address, uh, the right kind of address. Right. Yeah. Did you know more about that detail? Well, uh, basically, the way uh, the, the ruling in, in North Dakota just recently came out was that Native Americans had to have the street address 
on their voter registration. Mm -hmm. And historically, Native Americans have not had street addresses. So mm -hmm. it, this is another creative attempt mm -hmm. to try to disenfranchise people. Right. So there are efforts to, to um, certify uh, the Native Americans in the particular areas when they're voting. Sure. But there is a lot of doubt as to whether that's going to, to um, you know, be effective or not. Sure. And so one of, this, one of the things philosophically, historically, uh, over the last 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, the Koch brothers, who used to be affiliated with the John Birch Society, yep. uh, have funded to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars yep. think tanks around the country mm -hmm. to perfect messages that would basically restrict voting rights and to, to sure. uh, get their particular elitist type view across. Mm -hmm. sure. And that was heightened, uh, if you look at the book uh, Dark Money by Jane yep. Mayer. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane Mayer describes an incident on the same day that President Obama was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. There was a meeting of billionaires mm -hmm. in um, Palm, Palm Desert, California, mm -hmm. to try to strategize how to restrict uh, voting, mm -hmm. and pr principally that was on the redistricting process, and mm -hmm. to promote gerrymandering, mm -hmm. uh, which all happened since in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, they were actually sure. successful in the, after the 2010 census mm -hmm. to get gerrymandering mm -hmm. uh, even more mm -hmm. uh, uh, scary, more uh, more less unequal. Yeah, yeah, more unequal mm -hmm. than in the past. Mm -hmm. And so that has been an effort that uh, some of these mm -hmm. initiatives, especially Proposal 2, mm -hmm. have been trying to address. But what we have to do is be vigilant and make sure that the, the uh, decision makers aren't influenced by undue amounts of money in the political process, which is what's, what has happened over the last 40 years, but particularly in the, inside the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, one of the things that I was going to bring up with the address uh, situation, uh, I lived in Bath, just, so just about 20 minutes from here, I lived right on Main Street, but for some reason they wouldn't give us mailboxes. So we all had to have P.O. boxes and get all of our, our address and our mail and everything with our P.O. box. So if that would have restricted me from the right to vote, that would have been a problem and it would have been a problem for all of the people on that street and I can tell you it's because they're white and that would have made a difference and we would change laws based on that um, in my opinion uh, so I think that it's important that we have people that are on the court that actually are going to uphold the rights to vote for all of us not just you know the few wealthy elite well so I mean I think that w right now we're in a situation where we have uh, every day, pretty much on TV, radio, print media, everywhere, we hear about these um, uh, uh, attacks on our democratic institutions, attacks on our democratic government, etc. And um, uh, what people don't seem to realize is that what's really being attacked is the norms that a culture that, that, that have grown up around our government as our culture has moved on from where the founders were. Okay. And what's happened? What, what, what's happened is, for for example, people get angry at uh, at Mitch McConnell because he didn't give Merritt Garland a hearing. Well, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that he has to. The only reason that there that there's any sense that he that that he ought to have is because we have a we have a cultural uh, idea that we're supposed to be a democracy and we're supposed to be fair. Uh, and when he's not fair, then people get upset about that. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we have uh, uh, rules and laws to create public trust in our systems and institutions. And the systems and institutions that our founders designed and created are not designed to create broad public trust. They're designed to create public trust among uh, the wealthy elites who they were designed to put into power. Uh, and who w and who have been kept in power by those systems, as I described, you know, when we talked about the statistics a little bit ago. Um, so, um, uh, uh, you know, so what we're talking about here is we're talking about uh, our current culture, where we've gotten to in terms of how our, our beliefs about fairness and equality 
and uh, 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 you know, and and, uh, and and what it means to have a democracy and to have the right to vote. Those are all things that have changed culturally uh, over the past 242 years, but we haven't made those changes in law. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're really struggling with right now. And we need to recognize not to uh, look at our existing institutions and say, well, that's, you know, we're having attacks on democracy. What we're having attacks on is our sense of how they're supposed to work, not how they're actually designed. Yeah, and some of those attacks are some things that the states are not going to be best suited to handle. Right. For example, we've had documented evidence that the uh, foreign countries have hacked into our electoral process, mm -hmm. but they've also, um, they've also tried to influence elections on social media, which is uh, even more nefarious and more difficult to police. So because those protections weren't built in when uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, became predominant methods of communication, mm -hmm. now we're going trying to go back and fix that. Mm -hmm. But those kinds of things are going to need to be handled at the federal level mm -hmm. uh, because Michigan alone isn't going to be able to to uh, address those issues. They, they, sure. they go be well beyond our state boundaries. But the methods of trying to uh, spread untruthful information and to try to um, distort our electoral process. Those, mm -hmm. those we've got, we've got to watch very carefully to make mm -hmm. sure that those attempts to influence our election process are addressed strongly and fairly for everyone's benefit for mm -hmm. our continued uh, right. form of government. Right. Thoughts? It's interesting that you bring up, um, you know, foreign affairs and or foreign entities interfering in our elections because I think that if we had paid more attention and cared more about dark money in politics and done more to prevent um, you know untrue information being pushed out the way that it is then we never would have even had that as a problem in the first place because that would never have gotten there so the way that our systems are set up to allow people to lie, blatantly lie. I mean, I watched the uh, part of the gubernatorial debate in Michigan the other day, and they, nobody's calling people out for lying. Watching the mm -hmm. gubernatorial debate in Florida, the racist that's running against Gillum just blatantly lying to an entire crowd and everyone watching at home is just obnoxious and insane to me and I just I'm it surprises me that more people aren't up in arms and doing more and I feel like Republicans have no qualms with dark money and I feel like Democrats are just like well we have to instead of doing more to fight that and I'm it, it is a challenge where the thing. First Amendment protections for free speech and it used to be in the old days that they would say that the cure for bad speech is good speech, more speech. Yeah. But uh, things, the dynamics have changed since social media has become so so pervasive, and it, it made it very easy for uh, even domestic actors to uh, manipulate the system because it's it's basically goes going back to what's in people's brains if they have uh, r really distorted information, untrue information uh, that can't be countered by more speech, then uh, then we've got to figure out how to how to uh, curtail some of that and still still have the uh, viable First Amendment rights. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, so I, I, I think that I, I think that uh, I think that the problem isn't uh, 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 that good speech is is at a disadvantage against uh, uh, against uh, false speech. I think that, or, or, or uh, I think I, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think what's what's happened is that we uh, we have a Supreme Court that's decided that money is equal to speech. Yeah, that's that's, very th true. that's the key problem, and, and 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 the ridiculousness of that is that is, is that actually money is a social construct. Mm -hmm. Every single dollar that exists in the U.S. economy was originally spent by the U.S. government. Okay, literally, that's the only the, the U.S. government is literally the only entity that's empowered to create money. So that's just uh, that, that's just definitionally true. Um, uh, and the U.S. government is, if we believe that we're a democracy or a democratic republic or that we should be, um, then the U.S. government belongs to us 
And just like the roads and the bridges uh, are public infrastructure, so is money. So the idea that the idea that money is speech would be would be equivalent to the road is speech. You get to you know I, I get to uh, I, I get to do anything that I want on the road. It doesn't matter how big my car is, how much it weighs, how much tonnage I put on my truck, anything like that. Um, uh, that's ridiculous because we know that when you use a road like that, you damage it and uh, destroy its public utility. And we've all paid for that public utility. And exactly the same thing is true of actual money. That's where yeah, it comes we need from. To regulate, we need to regulate money in the political process. Absolutely. In a fair way. And Citizens United, uh, really, uh, that decision of the U.S. Supreme Court really restricted some of that. But uh, that's, again, why it's so important to have fair-minded justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. We need to have, and if, barring that, we need some U.S. constitutional amendments to, to take uh, charge mm -hmm. of the situation that uh, is really out of control right now. Right, right. I agree. 100% agree. I'd like to see, um, I mean, honestly, beyond rank choice voting that I mentioned earlier, I'd like to see a lot of the people that have gotten into this movement, th that I hope it's a movement, um, with Prop 2 and Prop 3 getting involved and trying to reverse mm -hmm. our Citizens United on steroids uh, bill that went through this last year in the Michigan legislature, and uh, SB 571, that was another very um, detrimental bill that went against um, Michiganders and the ability to actually help um, or be able to actually have that free speech that isn't controlled by the money. I'm no, I don't remember the number. What what was that? SB five seven one that happened about two or three years ago. And, and what did it do? Um, and that basically was a Michigan extension of the of Citizens United. Uh, okay. Okay. Do, 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 do you know the, the details? No, I, I actually I used to work details. for the legislature, but I haven't been around that process for a little while now, so mm -hmm. I'll have to get you up to yeah, speed. I'll when have you to look like. that up and, 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 and Yeah, and find I don't out. have I'll, the I'll, full I'll information talk. right now. I just okay. remember the feeling I felt yeah. when <laughs> I went through. Sure. It was infuriating. Sure. <laughs> That's actually the reason I got involved in politics in the first place, was to get money out of politics, because okay. it's absolutely ridiculous and unfair that we can't have, like, we can't actually have the same ability to influence our peers as those with money. Right. You know, the fact that you were upset about that process, and you know, that is one heartening thing in the last couple of years, to see the amount of citizen involvement in these two ballot proposals, mm -hmm. and also things like the Women's March, mm -hmm. and the door-to-door the -door, um, uh, efforts of a, a lot of people that are concerned about preserving our and enhancing our democratic process, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, the ends are, have to be legitimate, but the means of getting there have to be legitimate too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to have a fair process is what we're really talking about, sure. and, and enhancing our democratic process, and with a small d, uh, to be fair to everybody in our state, regardless of party, regardless of race, creed, sexually orient, sexual orientation, uh, we need fairness in our system, and we need to be on guard for any group or political uh, initiative that tries to take rights away. These are designed to take to give the citizens more rights and to make sure that the process itself is more more um, sane and and fair to everyone involved. Great. Um, so uh, I completely agree uh, with uh, with what you've just said there. I wish that we had the opposition, but every opposition person that I've talked to has ended up not being in opposition. So uh, everybody get out there and vote for Prop 3. I would also say Prop 2 and Prop 1. Um, and um, take a little, uh, a little break and then come back and maybe uh, clear up a couple of things or uh, talk about some other uh, interesting stuff. Okay, so um, we were just talking a minute ago about uh, SB 571 you had brought up. Um, yep. So I, I, I and think then over the break United you pulled. And Citizens United. On Citizens United and steroids. Okay. Um, which is a current law in Michigan that just came up in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. um, what this does is not only does Michigan law allow candidates to, this is from the Intercept mm -hmm. article about it, is mm -hmm. not only does the new Michigan law allow candidates to rake in unlimited amounts of money for super PACs, 
eschewing the meager federal limit. It also allows candidates, consultants, vendors, and attorneys to simultaneously work for a super PAC, so long as that person doesn't pass strategic information between the two. But as this says, that's not exactly practical since political consultants or ad buyers can't simply forget what they know about campaign internal strategies. So this is completely giving a leg up to super PACs and wealthy donors um, mm. in comparison to what we had before, which actually had limitations and mm -hmm. restrictions on um, super PACs working with candidates. Right. And, th and that, that was SB 571? No, that was the, uh, the Citizens, Citizens United, United on Steroids, Steroids that just came out um, mm. in the last year. Right. So this is really the first big election cycle that that's been implemented right. in. Um, with SB 571, that prohibits public bodies like libraries, secretary of state staff, um, from distributing information about ballot proposals 60 days before the election. It also eliminate, eliminated the February filing deadline for independent and political committees mm -hmm. um, and re and reestablishment of the requirements to file an annual report covering the period from October 21st through December 31st. And it also effectively doubles the amount of money PACs can donate to candidates for the second time in two years, which has in effect uh, quadrupled the limit since 2013 with the different laws that have passed in between then. Um, it also prohibits corporations from collecting contributions from its employees to a union's PAC. So mm. taking rights away from unions more than we've already right. done in the past. I specifically remember SB 571 because I was working with a group called Wolf Pack, which is a super pack to, it's basically a suicide super pack. It's a super pack to destroy all super packs, uh, created by Jen Huger from the Young Turks. Sure. Um, and when I found out about SB 571, I was just getting to California um, during the presidential primaries. Um, and I was helping a friend out there and I called the governor's office and I asked the lady at the governor's office, I said, please, can you do me a favor? And she said, what do you need? I said, can you go into the governor's office and take every pen out of his office? And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, do not let him sign this bill. Do not do it for the future of democracy in Michigan. Do not let him sign this bill. She thought I was crazy, but right. I was serious. Sure. So, so yeah. So it's just, it's it's another way of 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 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, super PACs to get more money. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, into the same candidates. Yeah, the the whole idea that that uh, uh, that who gets elected should have anything to do with how much money they can raise, I think is is, is just is is just uh, as antithetical to democracy as you can get. Absolutely. But y you wanted to talk some more about uh, about how th about how our current system works and 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 ideas of democracy. Yeah, we started out talking about fairness and sure. due process, and that fair play uh, is really important. If we're going to have any semblance of a democratic system, our, our mm -hmm. democracy requires that we have fair voting, mm -hmm. and that's really one of the linchpins of a, a whole process. Mm -hmm. If people cannot vote their vote isn't counted, if uh, as money in the political process is paramount mm -hmm. and um, thoughtful decision making by voters isn't um, the most important thing. Uh, we really need to make sure that we have a fair process, that's number one. We also need to make sure that citizens know that their vote is extremely important. When you look at voting figures of younger people, traditionally, mm -hmm. over a long span of time, younger people haven't had the voting participation as older people. Mm -hmm. And really, in talking with um, college students and high school students and, and uh, people that are just now getting to be voting age, they need to know the important part of our system of government uh, is voting. And mm -hmm that without that uh, we, we're going to drift toward an autocracy. It's not guaranteed that the United States will, will have the kind of public participation mm -hmm. we've had in the past even. Mm -hmm. So we really need to make sure that young people and people who don't think their, their vote is important to make sure that they do realize the direct connection between their vote 
in public policy because if they don't vote that means that the other people that um, that may, may not have their best interests at heart mm -hmm. are going to s carry the day. We really need to have the participation levels mm -hmm. up to um, a high amount to make sure that our system of government is preserved and protected. We especially is true when we have the redistricting coming up mm -hmm. after the uh, census in 2020. Right. Uh, the, the legislature and the system that will be in place then is going to determine what for the next 10 right. years yep. what it's going to be like right. uh, as far as redistricting and uh, making sure that we have these protections in place in Proposal 2 mm -hmm. and in Proposal 3 are critical for the next decade, mm -hmm. uh, more than next decade, for Michigan residents. So I, 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 I think that's absolutely true. I think that the problem with getting more voter participation, there, I, I think that uh, one of the key reasons that we have low voter participation is because uh, the impact that your vote has is uh, relatively small, and uh, and over the years it's it's actually gotten smaller. Um, uh, you know, so I mean, so so a lot of people don't, I, I don't think get how uh, how big the difference is. <laughs> what really grinds me too, Leo, is, uh, is the idea that was floated out there, especially before the last election, that hey, to certain groups, your vote doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Your vote doesn't count, doesn't matter, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the opposite is true. If we look at the highest levels of our government mm -hmm. and we see the drift toward uh, autocracy, you know, a drift toward uh, that uh, uh, a, f a very few people can control mm -hmm. what's best for everybody. Well, well, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, uh, let's let's be clear. This is the way that the Constitution is set up. When, uh, for example, uh, the way that the Senate works, you know, you have a situation where, for example, Wyoming, the least populous state, gets two senators. Michigan gets two senators. That means that you and I and everybody else in Michigan are vastly underrepresented in the U.S. Senate. Now, people will say, "Well, but all of the states are equal." Well, why does a piece of land have an influence on uh, what policies are that govern people? Okay, this is supposed to be a democracy, or demos means people. It's not a. It, it, it's not a. Uh, it, it, it's not a convention of landowners. Oh wait, it was designed as a convention of landowners. Not to okay. mention, if you look at the way that our Supreme Court justices are confirmed, that doesn't go through the House anyways. Right. So. Right. Putting uh, it through the Senate doesn't actually give the representation and the votes that should be right. used to decide right. who is going to have a life term right. on the Supreme Court. Right. So if you, if you go by population, I've done these numbers, by the way. At some point, I'll put them up on our website. I'm, I'm actually, I've got the spreadsheets done. I just got to make it look pretty. But um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the numbers, uh, if you say that what that that, that I if you believe that what democracy means is you get one person one vote, which is what actually the Supreme Court has yeah. said it's supposed to be, okay, and that and 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 that only makes sense if you also say and everybody's vote has an equal influence on the ki on the policies of the government because that's what the whole point is, right? Is to have an equal influence on the policy of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the government. So if we look at the numbers there. Um, Again, Wyoming being the smallest, uh, the the the, the, least, the lowest population state, um, they have a, a just under six hundred thousand people. If you take that, if you take their population and divide it into the population of Michigan, their population gets one representative in the in in, in the U in the U.S. House. If you take their population, divide it into Michigan's population, we should have 16, 16 house house reps. We have fourteen. That's being underrepresented by fourteen percent. Okay, so and and that's across. And w if you do that with every state, you find out that 34 of the 50 states are underrepresented by 10 percent or more. 20, uh, 24 of them are underrepresented by 20 percent or more, and three of them are underrepresented by 30 percent or more. Yeah, California and New York. Well, California yeah. is underrepresented by uh, uh, 26 percent. I was just looking oh, okay. at this earlier. They're, uh, 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 they're, they have they have 50, 53 House reps. If they had, if everybody in California had equal representation with everybody in Wyoming, they would have 67. But you're talking about the Senate as well, and there's no question that that's true. That's not a democratic feature of our Constitution. It was simply a compromise to get the big states and the small states to ratify. Well, it was. Well, let's, let's let's be clear. It wasn't about the big states and the small states. It was about the slave-owning states 
who wanted to make sure that they didn't that 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 uh, that people that didn't own slaves uh, and thought that owning slaves was was wrong yeah. would, would 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 vote them out of their property, right? Uh, you know, which they were considered human beings, and uh, so, so that's I mean, so you're clearly we right. Be clear about you're, that. you're cl clearly right that there's imperfections in our system and basically inherent, baked into our system, designed into our system. Yeah. It's not an accident. No question. And what we need to do is, okay, say, what is the art of the possible? Mm -hmm. what, what can we do? What positive steps can we mm -hmm. take to make sure that fairness moving forward? Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be a, a one-off one type thing that's going to solve that's everything. That's right. We're going to have step. to keep moving right. forward in the direction of, right. of greater participation in the system. And but, uh, but, the, but my point is that greater participation isn't going to be enough until we change some of those structural features that uh, that, that 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 intentionally underrepresent people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at you know, so I say that I, I say that California is underrepresented by twenty six percent in the U.S. House. If you look, at, uh, they're under they're underrepresented they're underrepresented in the Senate by ninety seven percent. And if you and if you combine that into the Electoral College, they're underrepresented in the Electoral College by fifty eight percent. Michigan, by the way, is underrepresented in the Electoral College by fifty percent exactly. To me, there's no reason why we need the Electoral College any, any longer whatsoever. Yeah. Right. You look at the election of 2000 and uh, uh, the most recent election, sure. a majority of the people, or at least the plurality of the people, wanted one candidate and mm -hmm. we actually ended up with somebody right. else. Now, and, and you notice, by the way, that it's exactly the, the, kind of, the, the kind of thing that the founders designed the Electoral College to do. The only power the Electoral College has is to overturn the will of the people. Yeah. That tells you right there that the, that, that the founders were not interested in the will of the people. Of course, for some of these things, it's going to take a U.S. constitutional amendment. Absolutely, and that uh, it's not not easy to do by design. Sure, um, and that may well be part of what should be in, done in the future. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. Um, and there are other things that we could, you know, think of that would be in the mm -hmm. steps of a more perfect union, as sure. they say. Right. Absolutely. Uh, but right now, uh, we've got some things we can do mm -hmm. as very practical steps mm -hmm. to enhance the process in Michigan sure. and in other states right now, too. Uh, we need to make sure that people are aware of what's going on um, right. in the U.S. Congress, in the state legislature, and, and with our administration and the Supreme Court. Right. It's that, that awareness that I'm very hopeful will carry forward. Uh, and be enhanced by mm -hmm. the level of the intense level of participation mm -hmm. we've had, uh, again, by a uh, number of groups and women and sure. uh, the, the participation in the groups that you're affiliated with. Uh, that Those are all important steps to make sure we get it a, a better system for our, our kids and our, and our grandkids. A absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry, did you have something? Cause I, so you know. <coughs> I think that... I mean, I think that Promote the Vote and um, Prop 2 and other things that we've been talking about are all going to enhance the dem democratic system. Um, and we have seen an uptick of participation, especially participation outside of voting, which is extremely important. I think voting is like bare bones, bare minimum that we should all be doing. Um, but there's so many people that don't vote. There's so many people that don't believe that their vote counts. They don't mm -hmm. think that it matters, and it doesn't matter who is elected. They're all corrupt anyways. Or you know, we've all heard the millions mm -hmm. of reasons people don't vote. Um, how do you think we can reach those people? How do you think that we can get to those people and say these are the things that we're changing, or try to get them out in any way that they're we haven't been doing so far. It's a slow process and you pointed out that just in the conversation you had within the last 24 hours mm -hmm. that you are able to get somebody to take a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. You know it's that one of those one-on-one -on -one conversations I think where it's really at and when when I had the opportunity to uh, serve on the staff of the legislature. I got to know a number of legislators up close and personal and I do know that there's some very uh, caring people and I can think of people on both sides of the aisle and one specific example was a um, then a, a state house of representatives member a Republican by the name of Vern Ehlers and at one point I was also an advocate and uh, I asked uh, um, then 
uh, Representative Ehlers, he later became a senator and a U.S. Uh, congressman. I asked, he's also had a Ph.D. in physics from UCAL Berkeley, so he's extremely bright. I asked him if I could count on his support for a measure, and he says, I don't know. I want to listen to the other side. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the perfect statement to say, okay, look at both sides of the issue before you make a decision. Look at the pros and cons of the candidates. And yes, if you really don't know anything about the political process and you choose not to vote, fine. But really what we need to, to do is get more informed people in the system and more informed legislators in the system uh, and Congress people because uh, to take a look at both sides of the issue carefully and to really understand in depth and not just use uh, social media as your source of information <laughs> right. as some politicians seem to want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's, not gonna, it's not ever going to be a perfect system, but we can definitely demand that our elected officials are aware of things and listen to us mm -hmm. because if they don't, they should be voted out of office. Right. So I, I, uh, I wanted. There was one thing that you said. I, I agree with everything that you said there. I think that th those are those are all really really important important points to move. Uh, but I think that uh, you, you used a phrase that uh, actually I think goes back to Otto von Bismarck. The, uh, 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 that uh, uh, politics is the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I, I've seen it attributed to Cuomo, but I actually think it goes goes back to oh Bismarck. Yeah. It goes a lo long yeah, way back. Long way back. And um, that's actually I think that uh, something that's different about progressive politics uh, versus uh, uh, establishment politics. I think, establ I, th I think establishment politics is absolutely politics is the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. Don't try to get me to do more than, than I think that I can do. I mean, that was... Uh, you know, uh, that was the argument that we were having about, you know, uh, between uh, uh, Whitmer and Abdul about uh, health care. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the thing is, is that if, you're po if politics is always just the art of the possible, then you never change what's possible. Well, and you need both. You need the progressive. You need forces to say, okay, here's what we need to do, mm -hmm. and eventually, a lot of that uh, philosophy gets ingrained. I remember back when the environmental movement was popular, mm -hmm. popular with both parties, sure. and you know, uh, the good old days. Yeah, <laughs> President Nixon well, actually was help, helpful yeah, in getting the, the clean air. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, so, sure. uh, so. It starts maybe with an impossible uh, push. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Senator Sanders has actually made what looked to be impossible mm -hmm. much more so in terms right. of uh, health insurance. And so, right, no, I just, I just want to say so. That's exactly. I think that I think that progressive politics says that politics is the art of changing the possible. And that's good. And that's and that's that that's what we have to. Uh, uh, that's what we have to push. Is is that is that it's not acceptable anymore to just say that politics is the art of the possible. We have to say is politics is the art of changing the possible by changing people's minds. Like you said, I w just in the last 24 hours I experienced that, and you experienced that all over the country right now. And part of what Sanders did, to your point about you know about how he changed what's possible in 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 in, in, in medical care. Uh, is that um, he came out and said, "I'm a democratic socialist." I, yeah. and, and and basically what he's saying, basically he's he's saying that he's basically FDR. I mean, in terms <laughs> of his policies. But what he did was, is he got a lot of people all across the country who have been privately in their little groups or by themselves yeah. thinking, you know what? There's this other way that I've read about and I've learned about that. And yeah. when he, you know, when Sanders started calling, started being on on, on the front page saying, "I'm a democratic socialist. Healthcare is a human right." A lot of these people stood up and looked around and said, hey, there's a whole bunch of us yeah. here. Yeah, and know. that's an extremely important function. Mm -hmm. It's rare that you find both a pathfinder and a consensus build builder in the same mm -hmm. in the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I work a little bit with uh, former representatives, former speaker, Bill Ryan, mm -hmm. who was that type of person who was both a consensus builder mm -hmm. and a pathfinder. He mm -hmm. was an uh, effective advocate for mm -hmm new new uh, uh, ventures, new pathways, mm -hmm. but he was also able to get the votes to get something through mm -hmm. and work across party lines. Mm -hmm. So we need both types of people in our system in order to get real change. Sure. Um, I, 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 I absolutely, absolutely, absolutely agree, but I think that I, I really, I, I think that it's important to be clear about which one of those kinds of people we need to have 
out there as uh, top line leaders that are that that are on television and in the newspaper and all of that kind of stuff. And the people that we need there are the trailblazers, not the people who are going to say politics is the art of the possible, but the people that are going to say politics is the art of changing the possible. Politics is we're going to make this argument and we're going to uh, we're going to work hard to to show people why this is a better way than that way. Um, and you also need uh, to work across party lines in order sure. to get those magic number of votes as an even number plus, plus one. You need a majority uh, mm -hmm. in order to get a bill over to the governor. So there is an art form, and I think that's an extremely invaluable sure. part of the Absolutely. puzzle, too. Absolutely. I think one big part of that is that it's one thing that I saw with uh, specifically Senator Sanders is that he didn't just motivate people to get involved and say, let's work towards what we've always been told is impossible, what we've always been told is radical and mm -hmm. crazy. <laughs> he said, let's fight for these things yeah. together. And he got people motivated to work together on mm -hmm. that. And so I went from a voter to an activist, sorry. Mm, no um, I went from just a voter to an activist in, um, you know, the matter of basically five minutes because of listening mm -hmm. to him. Good. And my mom went from a non-voter to a voter mm -hmm. in the matter of watching a VFW video for 20 minutes, like congratulating mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. Um, but I think that that, that step up, mm -hmm. everybody made like their own step up. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we continue to have leaders like that, mm -hmm. that maybe, you know, one day I'll run mm -hmm. for office again and actually be able to make change mm -hmm. in that way. And my mom will turn into the activist, mm -hmm. and you know, somebody else will go from voter to or non-voter mm -hmm. to a voter. Yeah. Sure. So no, I, I think I think that's exactly the thing is that you have to have uh, a message about how we're going to make the future yeah. better than than, than the present. Um, uh, and uh, and and to do and, and and that will encourage more people to vote. But we also but uh, on top of that, uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to change some of the structural things that we've discussed. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and we ahead. also need to to make sure that we're effective in delivering the message. Mm -hmm. One of the best examples that I've seen ever seen of that was Phil Hart when he mm -hmm. he gave a, a talk about um, he compared the electorate that he compared the u.s senate to a family mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh he he came out in, in favor of one candidate for mm -hmm. president mm -hmm. uh he says you know when a, a leader of a family has mm -hmm. to make a decision you, you look at more than one variable mm -hmm. and uh the more that people that want to seek change are effective at talking about values mm -hmm. and translating those into understandable bite-sized mm -hmm. chunks to move their colleagues mm -hmm. and move the electorate, sure. uh, the better we can uh, translate these good right. ideas into public policy. Absolutely, and I think, and I, and I think I, I, the fact of the matter is, I think that th that the left has the better values argument. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. The problem is, is that uh, one of those values is that we don't try to impose our values on others. Okay, you know, uh, so uh, uh, you know, so we're more uh, on the left. We're much more likely to say, let's 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 talk about this. Let's try to let, let's try to have a discussion rather than I have the power to make this happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, and therefore I'm just going to do it. I mean that's uh, that's what uh, that that that's what McConnell did when we talked about you know Kavanaugh earlier and with with Merrick Garland. That's what uh, uh, that's what a lot of uh, that's what gets Republicans in power in trouble a lot more than Democrats in power. When you say when you when you hear a politician say um, like we've heard before that the reason I'm doing something is because I can. Mm -hmm. That should scare the heck out of people. Absolutely. Because really, what they should be thinking about is what's best for the people. Absolutely. And when they do that, then they can't mm -hmm. stray too far right. awry. But when they say, I have the power because, you know, and, I, and I'm going to do mm -hmm. it just because I can, right. to me, that's uh, totally adverse to where we should be as a country and as a state. Right. I, I want to make another point about the whole values argument too. Is that is that um, uh, 
Well, we, you know, we started out talking about Proposition Three, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the the um, uh, the object some of the objections, as, which, as we said, were are, are really completely ridiculous. Well, some of the objections were, well, but you know, uh, uh, you're putting all of this, you know, you're putting all of this in the Constitution rather than you know, uh, and it's a lot, and you know, all of these kinds of objections. But I, I want to point out that. When we're talking about values, the values should be in the Constitution, and we should have a way of working out those values. And the reason that we end up having to put more stuff into the Constitution is because there are too many people that aren't willing to follow the values of the con the values of the Constitution. Um, uh, you know, in carrying out their their duties under it, mm -hmm. um, they're more they're, they're more interested in imposing their own personal values. Uh, you know the whole I, I mean the whole idea that 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 the U.S. for example is a Christian nation. I mean anybody that's read the history knows that that's just wrong. It's just a complete lie out of the uh, out of the right wing that um, uh, that that they use to justify uh, doing what they want rather than doing uh, you know uh, doing things that that match the values of. Uh, the country as a whole, mm -hmm. um, and the ideals that we uh, that 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 we claim we represent. Yes, and uh, we should represent a religious tolerance and freedom of religion. Absolutely, as, as put in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, as originally adopted, mm -hmm. uh, and including the state constitution, we took a lot of lessons from what happened overseas in England because mm -hmm. that was their that was their knowledge base. Mm -hmm. England and to some degree France for mm -hmm. the separation of power, sure. powers. Sure. Same thing with the common law. Right. A lot of what our body of law mm -hmm. in in almost every state, except Louisiana, mm -hmm. it's, uh, sure. is based on lessons learned from the way they did things in England, mm -hmm. and they adopted the common law in, in the United States, and they adopted constitution based on past mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, with the current makeup of our our government right now, we're learning at a very rapid rate what some of the mistakes you can make in terms of authoritarianism, and we hope I hope that we learn those well enough to adopt some of the changes that are going to be necessary to put right in the U.S. Constitution and to some degree the state constitutions. Sure. Let, let me just say, by the way, you, you, you mentioned rightly that they that they copied uh, and tried to eliminate some of the some of the problems that they found in uh, what their experience was in your in, in the European monarchies. Right. Uh, as as some of them were transitioning uh, into other forms of government, but yeah. what, but 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 remember that the, that that whole that whole historical process uh, uh, is 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 about is about the conversion from a, is about changing from a feudal society uh, a into an in, in, into a mercantilist yeah. uh, uh, into a mercantile capitalist society, and what they what what they did is they is is they is is they wanted they wanted to maintain the power of the wealthy elites. Right. Uh, so those are the only people that are allowed to vote. But then even those people, they didn't really trust them to maintain the power of the wealthy elites. Uh, and part of the reason that they didn't is because they saw all of the infighting and, and, and backstabbing and so on that went on in the uh, 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 in Europe, in, in the European monarchies that they came from, and so what they what they designed what what they what they designed was a uh, an aristocracy without a king, True. Um, uh, where the aristocrats uh, had a uh, uh, had a system of represent uh, of of electing representatives of the aristocrats to run the government. That's true. Uh, you know that that's the system that we have, mm -hmm. and 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 when we're when we're talking about transitioning from that kind of a system into a system that's really a democracy or a democratic republic, I'm not at all. Uh, uh, well, we can talk about republican uh, another time, but that, that that's a term that gets misused. But when we're talking about transforming the system that they designed, which is really all about the aristocrats, into a system that's really all about uh, the people, um, we have to look at the mistakes that they made, and we have to look at how to correct those mistakes. And we're just about out of time. Any last thoughts from anybody? Just get out and vote November 6th, 7 to 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Polls are open. That's vote right. Vote for Prop 2 and Prop 3. Yeah. Right. And if you can vote absentee, vote absentee because it's going to take a while. To yeah, vote. we're good. expecting very long lines uh, because we have an inadequate system, <laughs> but uh, you, can, you can vote uh, absentee. Uh, and uh, I one encourage you to do One thing, too, that. I want to point out sure. is, too, is a big thank you to all the people that helped get Prop 2 and Prop 3 on the ballot. Absolutely. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of effort, and uh, we want to make sure that effort is carried out to fruition. So right. vote and 
That's right. Make sure your family and friends are voting too. Right. Bring five, ten people with you to the polls. Don't go alone. That's right. Voting is a community activity. Bring your community, That's bring right. your family, bring your friends. Let's everybody get out and vote. Yes, on one, two, and three, I would argue. Uh, and um, have a good evening, folks. Thank you. Okay.